Everybody says they want American solar. Well, in Texas, it's finally happening. I'm here at the SEG Solar Facilities in the heart of energy country, Houston, Texas. Let's go see what's different about SEG Solar. Nico, as we kind of start start looking at the factory and start the tour here, one of the things that we should really highlight is uh, one of the more complicated, one of the more technical pieces of equipment we have in our facility is our stringer. And this stringer is actually a, a little larger, it's a little faster than what you would see historically in any other module manufacturer. So it's actually the kind of largest, fastest one in the world currently. Yeah. I'm sure we'll see other folks kind of adopt this and, and kind of move this direction. But again, this, this stringer is about 1.3 times faster than any other stringer that's currently being used by any other manufacturer. And when you say stringer, what is it stringing? Yeah, so it's taking the cells, it's actually laser cutting, it's cutting those cells. And then uh, again, it's putting the half cells into strings. There's 12 strings on a module. Right. So what was traditionally done by hand is this process, right? The cells were cut, yeah. they were lined up, and then they were all soldered together. Yeah. Years ago, when we worked together at a different module manufacturer, Nico, you know, this was all done by hand. It wasn't even that many years ago. I mean, you, all of this was done by hand, and now it's fully automated at this point. When we look at manufacturing here in the U.S., one of the challenges is labor. There isn't this huge workforce of readily available folks like there is in Southeast Asia. You could go and open a factory in Southeast Asia and within 30 days have plenty of folks with experience that know how to run the, this type of equipment, know how to make solar modules. Here in the U.S., we don't have that. And so we realized and knew early on that we had to do more automation. We had to, you know, create more scale by building larger equipment, using faster equipment, and that's what we did here in Houston. So essentially some of the answer for why this is one of the most automated and high-tech modern facilities is because there just isn't an ample supply of the kinds of technicians needed to run the machines? That's correct. Wow. And so again, as you, as you start looking at bringing people aboard, you really only need about 18 people to run a shift in this facility. We talked about 500 jobs. Where are those 500 jobs being allocated? Yeah, so when you look at, you know, again, here in our, our facility, you know, when we talk about people per line, that's, that's per shift. And so again, multiple shifts. As you look at our facility, we have more space to scale. Yeah, and so as we course. continue to grow this facility out, from two gigawatts to whether we whether we end up scaling up to five gigawatts, um, we have room to add more manufacturing employees. There's warehouse employees. There's we have marketing. We're building out a four million dollar lab over next door where we're going to do research, development, those types of things. We're going to add junction box manufacturing kind of nearby at a different site. And so when you look at kind of the cumulative impact of everything that we're doing, it's about 500 jobs here in the Houston, Texas area. I remember it did seem like you believed you had an inside track. One of those insights that you gleaned is the critical path item that is the transformer. Could you talk about the difficulty of trying to find, kind of trying to find the Venn diagram of where to put the factory mm -hmm. coupled with how important the on-site electricity is and how you threaded that needle? Yeah, of course. So. Most importantly, I think, you know, let me, let me take one step back from that and say, when you look at, you know, why we're here in Texas, I mean, you look at where the market was gonna be at the time, Houston or Texas itself was an up and coming solar market. We knew it was gonna be the largest market in the US. Yeah, this is circa 22. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. You know, as early as 2020, we saw that Texas was, you know, a 2.4, 2.5 gigawatt market. And it was just gonna to continue to grow once you looked at kind of the queue and what was, what was gonna happen in this right. state. And so again, to Quint Gretzky, where's the puck going to be versus yeah. where it's at? It was obviously gonna be here in Texas. Again, locating in Texas makes a whole lot of sense because number one, we have a world-class port here in Houston. It's one of the best ones, if not the best one here in the country. Houston's the third largest city in the US. And so as we look at the labor pool and finding not only folks who are gonna kind of work in the labor, engineering, accounting, all of those types of jobs that are here at SCG, we have a number of accountants, we have people working in research, development, we have folks with PhDs doing, you know, working in the laboratory here. And so again, looking for that diverse pool of folks, they're all here in Houston. Again, third largest city in the US. Picking that you're gonna be here in Texas is, 
you know, one thing. But then understanding that working in the solar industry, we have a lot of, uh, I guess, discussions with utilities, with developers, with IPPs. And it, you know, it was very apparent a few years ago that transformer lead times were not only going to increase, yeah. but it was going to get worse. And so, you know, part of the uh, process of looking for a site, looking for a location, was to make sure that, A, were the transformer lead times going to be better for this facility? Could we find a facility with the existing transformers in place to run the electrical demands of a facility like this? And so we were able to find a facility. This used to be an existing medical manu uh, device manufacturer. Okay. They had a lot of the electrical infrastructure already in place. And the transformers that we would need for this site were shorter lead time. So okay. again, we could have built this in a number of other cities, different locations, but transformer lead time is about two years yeah. if, if we would have done it a different way. For many, myself included, today was the first time they got a chance to tour the facility, got a chance to actually see what an automated solar factory looks like. What was some of the feedback that you got from the customers that came to the tour today? Yeah, so I, I again, a lot of folks were shocked at the scale, so again, as Customers, uh, a lot of these customers have been to other facilities, maybe they're 400 megawatt lines or anything. And so they've never really seen anything kind of at this scale, this size, as we walk along the assembly line. I mean, it's like, a, I don't know that, it's, it's, it feels like a mile walk, you know, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure exactly Tunes how far. 17,000 feet. Okay, so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a very long walk. Yeah. And, um, you know, you could get all your steps in on your Apple Watch very easily, just yeah. kind of walking the uh, assembly line here at SCG. But, oh, yeah. yeah, of course. And so, so, again, finding a facility, making sure that these lines were, you know, able to achieve scale. Because what we don't want to do is you don't want to open up five gigawatt facility and not have the manpower to staff it. Yeah. You know, you're going to run your facility at partial utilization. What we knew we needed to do here was we knew that we could build a two gigawatt facility, we could run it at a much higher utilization, and then we could add to it as demand increased. And yep. so, again, it wouldn't have done any good to have a five gig facility if we didn't have the manpower to staff it. And so it's gonna take, it's gonna take well over a year for us, and we can, we can double the capacity of this facility in six months if we want to. What other observations from folks who perhaps have been to other factories before stands out to you? Yeah, so some of our buyers are huge. They're multiple gigawatt a year buyers. And as they've kind of walked through this facility, they are also kind of just flabbergasted, blown away at the yeah. scale of all this equipment. I mean, these are the, this is the largest line in the world. What we have and, here. Yeah, and it's, it, it's massive. It's running faster, it's bigger. Again, the stereotypical bigger in Texas, this is, <laughs> you know, 100% that case is that, you know, this is much bigger here in Texas. Yeah. It's the biggest one in the world. As we walk by, what is this thing that we're walking by? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is the laminator. And so essentially what it's doing is it's heating the two sheets of glass as well as the EVA, it's kind yeah. of essentially melting it. And at yeah. this point, it's permanently glued together. It may seem like an odd question, but I wonder why is it important to you to have the largest laminator in the world, the largest, there are three or four other things I could fill in the blank here at this facility. Mm -hmm. I know we're in Texas. I know that you have the ability and obviously you're building one of the first factories to come online in the States, but talk to me about uh, just the relative importance. Why is this the first factory that has a Horad laminator this size? Yeah, so again, when you look at the manufacturing here in the US, you know, this isn't the first rodeo, this isn't the first time we've done this. For me personally, this is the third manufacturer that I've worked with here in the US that has had a presence here in the US. And labor is always the issue. And so yeah. when you look at training labor, getting labor aboard, you just, you, you, it's going to take a lot of time. It's not like Southeast Asia where, you know, you open up your doors and within 30 days you have a flood of applicants that know how to put together solar modules sure. that have worked in solar panel manufacturing. You need to be able to train as few of folks and utilize as much of the equipment as possible. Again, when you look at a lot of the facilities that are going to open here in the U.S., they might be five gigawatts in size, but you're going to need a lot of people to work in that facility and it's going to take a long time to get the utilization up however in our facility because the equipment's larger and has more throughput you need less people to do that and you can add equipment as you start to scale up so our utilization will be higher i see which will get our costs down and allow us to be much more competitive than our it sounds like uh, in a way it also future proofs the scalability of correct. the facility correct correct and 
Again, labor is, as everybody will say in manufacturing, you know, labor is the challenge that everybody is facing right now. You know, Texas, as the now second, soon to be first largest market in the U.S., feels like it's predominantly utility scale. Is there a difference in buying behavior uh, or, you know, requirements on a manufacturer when you service largely utility scale? How do you balance that as the CEO in terms of the product mix in your yeah. factory. Yeah, of course. So again, our we, we depend on utility scale. I mean, that's really what keeps the factory running, that allows us to get scale and get all of our fixed costs down. We have to make sure we have large utility orders throughout kind of the year and into, into the next year as well. And so again, very important to us. When you look at the market like Texas, you know, hail is an issue here. Yeah. And so we have to be very conscious about, you know, how our modules perform in hail. And so obviously, uh, maybe not so obviously, but Again, I keep saying obviously the the 182 millimeter product uh, with a transparent back sheet functions uh, does a little bit better in hail than some of the larger modules. Yeah. But again, when we look at our larger format, our 720, we're actually a top performer in uh, I guess hail resiliency under PVEL's uh, scorecard. So yeah. we are very conscious. Hail is a huge issue here in Texas. Right. And when we look at utility scale projects, because Texas is in our backyard, this is a market we're heavily focused on for our solar modules. We have to make sure that our modules are as resilient to hell strike as it can possibly be. I guess my question is, how does it impact the cadence in the factory? How does it impact the day-to-day -day workflow when you're trying to make a decision between ser serving the distributed generation market versus the utility client. Yeah, so again, we, we, we have to plan out what our production looks like. It takes about a week to tool up and change module formats. Yeah. And so a line is going to be shut down for for a week to do yeah. that. And so, you know, we have two lines here and we have to make sure that those lines are, are running as needed. And so if we have to tool one up for residential, we wanna make sure we build enough residential modules that we have enough for that period of time. So when we can schedule the next production run, right. um, there's enough product until then. So forecasting is very important for residential, for distribution customers. Um, and then the other line, we, we try to run at least one line Making utility, yeah, making utility only. We don't, we don't mess with it, but the second line, we will run residential, and if we need to scale down into a smaller format module or a medium format module, we'll do that.